Hey everyone. So today we are going to start talking about work. Um, so work is uh, an important concept, and here is why. So we have been talking about forces a lot. It's like we're on this side, say, of some river flowing. Uh, we're on this side of this shore here. We're on the force side of the shore. Uh, and we need to get over to this other side of the shore called mechanical energy. So there are a couple different languages that you can use to talk about uh, dynamics or dynamical problems. Uh, one of them is forces. This one we've gotten familiar with over the course of the last few weeks. And uh, we want to learn another one, uh, the language of mechanical energy. Uh, and a very, our, our important, uh, the important concept that's going to bridge this gap uh, here between these two quantities is called work. So work, uh, you might remember say, from high school, uh, you might have been taught that work uh, is force times distance. So uh, that's true in simple uh, cases, but we're going to learn uh, the even more complex cases uh, now where uh, work is, is a bit uh, more involved than just being uh, force times a distance. So let's say that I have a box here, a box of mass M that's resting say, on a table. Um, and I take and I pull the box uh, this way. Yeah, I pull it off to the right. Then I'm, so if the box is sliding along this surface, then there's some change in its uh, kinematic properties, right? The velocity will uh, increase, right? Because it starts out at rest, I pull on it, and uh, it's gonna, uh, it's then going to have some velocity that's non-zero. So uh, I'm introducing some change into the uh, mechanical uh, properties of the system. Now, what if I, instead of pulling on this box this way, just get rid of this thing, and instead I just kind of sit on the box and uh, exert this force down uh, towards the ground. So, so long as you know, the ground is still there, uh, and it's uh, just going to push back up uh, on the box with a normal force, then um, this force here is, uh, it's, it's a real force, right? It's definitely there. Uh, but it's not actually making any change to the kinematic properties of the box, right? Because the box is still going to stay in the same spot, right? So its position isn't changing. Uh, its velocity isn't changing because uh, it's still there, static, right? Its acceleration is zero. So uh, this force that I exert on the box pushing down on it onto the table uh, or onto the floor is doing something that's a little bit different than this force that I used to pull the thing off to the right. Now, the way to say this uh, properly, then, if we go back to talking about uh, this force that's going off to the right, is to say when I pull on this box and I pull it off in this direction, I am doing work on the box. I'm able to do work w uh, when the box slides. But I'm not able to do work by pushing down on the box because there is this counteracting force. And the two of them uh, then have a different amount uh, of work. Uh, they, they do a different amount of work on the box, even if, say, they have the exact same magnitude uh, of the force. So uh, work is, in this very simple case, where I have a constant force, and I'm, say, pulling something Let's say that I take and I apply this force constantly over some distance d. Then uh, work is just the force that I pulled on the box times d. OK, and um, work is equal to then right, force uh, times the, its, its distance in this very simple case where the distance is going in that direction and the force is also going in that direction. Uh, if I were to draw the displacement vector on here, let me grab a different color uh, for that. So here, if I were to draw uh, a displacement vector, right, so here's my displacement vector, d. Uh, notice, right, my displacement vector and my force vector are now parallel to one another in this case, right? Uh, so um, this is actually, uh, this turns out to be the only case where work is force times distance, is when the distance vector and the force vector are, uh, are parallel to one another. So let's just uh, actually write the more serious uh, definition of force. So this is the case for constant uh, force and 
Fp is, uh, the force vector, is parallel to D, the displacement vector. Okay. Now, let's uh, use a different, a more complicated case. Let's say that I take this force vector, and instead of pulling the box straight in this direction, I angle it up a little bit. Okay, just adjust it so you had a little bit better view. Okay, now, this is the case, right, where work is force times distance when uh, we have a constant force, two things, constant force, and that the force is parallel to the displacement vector. Now, let's just uh, talk about, uh, introduce why work is actually uh, connected to mechanical energy in the first place. So, you guys remember this, uh, this good old friend, right, this is an old friend by now, this kinematic equation that the final velocity squared is equal to the initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times displacement. Um, and you also uh, know, right, Newton's second law, that's an old friend by now, F equals ma. Well, let's just put these two things together, right, in our case uh, for this box. So in this case, uh, the force is just uh, the force Fp, uh, the pull. M is the mass of the box. Uh, we then have, right, that the acceleration uh, of the box is just Fp over m. And uh, so I can put that into this equation here, right? Fp over m can go in for a there. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, put that in. And I'll also subtract b0 from, uh, squared from both sides. Right? I have bf squared then minus uh, b0 squared equals uh, 2 times Fp over m times, uh, well, d is the, the distance that we, were, uh, that we traveled, so I'll put d in for our displacement. So, okay, um, this is interesting. So we have Fp times d, that's the work done, right? So Fp times d, this here, is uh, equal to work, w. Um, so let's get work alone, okay? Uh, work which is uh, Fp times d, uh, the total distance, is equal to uh, this difference in the velocities squared uh, times, uh, well, I got to get a one half, I got to multiply by one half on both sides and multiply by mass on both sides to get work alone. So I get right, a one half times a mass velocity final squared minus one half times mass, times velocity, initial squared. Now, work, which is the force times distance in this simple case, is equal to one half mass times velocity final squared minus one half mass times velocity initial squared. This is interesting because there is a term, uh, th there is a term that, another term I need to introduce here, which is kinetic energy. So this term here, uh, th th this term here, kinetic energy, is part of that other side of the bridge. Kinetic energy, kinetic energy, is the energy due to motion. Okay, mechanical energy comes in two parts. Uh, two parts. There's uh, potential energy, uh, which we'll talk about later, and there's kinetic energy, which is the energy due to motion. So kinetic energy is uh, one half mass times velocity squared. So uh, what that means then is, uh, in this case, right, where I have this force uh, pulling this object a certain distance, the work is equal to uh, the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy. So uh, work, in this case, is equal to right, the change in Ke, or kinetic energy. And uh, this actually turns out to be uh, exactly uh, true once I, I, I specify, uh, not just in this special case here, but uh, in every case, once I specify uh, this here, that this work has to be the net work done on an object. So this is called uh, the work, uh, work energy theorem. It states that the net work done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the object. Now remember, kinetic energy is that energy due to motion. So um, when net work is done on an object, okay, that by net work I mean you have to sum up the amount of work that is done by each force uh, that is uh, acting on an object. So, for example, if there was a friction force pulling this thing back, uh, then you would need uh, to have right, this work, uh, this force times distance here, 
plus the work that is done by the friction force, which is actually going to be a negative term. So uh, our change in kinetic energy would be less in that case of a frictional force. Um, but anyway, setting that aside, right, the network on a, that is done on an object is equal to the change in that object's uh, kinetic energy. So that is always true. Uh, so that this uh, idea that uh, network is equal to change in kinetic energy is called the work energy principle or the WEP. So um, I like to make up acronyms for things because I think it actually helps you guys uh, remember them. The WEP or the work energy principle says that the network done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy, where kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. Uh, and it will be your friend uh, and is often the times an easier way to solve problems than, um, than some of the other ways that uh, you might try and solve a problem, uh, including you know, just uh, summing things, uh, summing forces up and using Newton's second law. So, um, excellent. Now, uh, let's generalize this a bit. This uh, problem, this exact problem that we had done here, uh, was for a constant force uh, when uh, F uh, uh, the force that is acting on something is parallel to uh, its displacement. So let's generalize this a bit. Here I have drawn up uh, a second case where notice my force vector is now pulling up at an angle. So now I'm taking a box and I'm, I'm no longer just pulling it this way, straight horizontally. I'm pulling it up in the air, right? So um, now, how does this change the problem? Well, so notice, right, not, uh, so if work is this thing that brings about this change in kinetic energy, it's something that I had said er earlier, work is what happens when a force is actually acting over a distance and um, bringing about a change in the kinematic properties of the object. Um, so let's take a look at this force. Now it has two components, right? There's an FPX uh, here, and there's an FPY uh, here. Notice that only one of these two uh, forces is actually going to do, uh, is actually going to contribute to that change in the kinematic properties of the box, right? That uh, Y force here doesn't really do anything, right? We're, we're talking about the frictionless case here. So forget about the fact that, well, the Y kind of, you know, lifts it up a little bit so there's a little less friction force on there. Yeah, that's true, but like set that aside for a minute, right? The X component of the force is the thing that's doing all of the work. It's the thing that is uh, introducing this change into the, uh, the kinematic properties of the object. Right? If you don't believe me, think about it this way. What if the F X component went away? What if I was just pulling straight up? Okay. Well, as long as I wasn't pulling up with more force than, uh, than the weight of the box, then the box is just going to sit there. Right? And when the box is just sitting there, there's no change in the kinematic properties. Right? There's no velocity initiated. There's no change in the kinetic energy of that object. So um, it is the X component of the force that is doing all that work. So um, the x component of the force, right, is equal to uh, Fp, Fp times cosine uh, of theta, right? That's the x component. And it turns out that the work done then is going to be Fp times cosine um, times uh, the displacement, the total displacement d times the cosine of theta in this case here. Now, this uh, is the amount of work done where we've relaxed this, uh, uh, this, we've relaxed this criteria that uh, the force uh, and the displacement are parallel to one another, right? They're not anymore. Uh, we still require constant force. Okay, so this is still constant force. Now, this might look suspiciously similar to something you saw very recently. Remember, we talked about dot products, okay? And dot products, when we talked about dot products, we said if you have a vector A and you want to do a dot product with a vector B, it will be equal to uh, A, B times the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. Remember that? Uh, so A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between the two. Right? We also said that it's equal to that component of A that is parallel to B uh, times B 
or that uh, component, or, or A, I could make A the kind of principal axis, and say, well, I, or I can take A times uh, B, component of B that is parallel to A. That's another way to write it. Or I could write it out as like AX, BX, plus AY, BY, right? Or I could add the plus AZ, BZ, if I so desire. OK. Um, if there, I mean, if I so desire. If there is a third uh, component. Now, if you don't remember me talking about this, uh, then uh, go back and watch the last lecture again. Um, so, because this is important, uh, work turns out to be defined uh, in terms of a dot product, which is why we introduced dot products uh, just recently. So, another way of writing this, right, is that work is equal to fp dot the displacement vector d. Okay. fp dot d. Now, remember, or when we talk about uh, uh, dot products, how if we have two vectors that are uh, perpendicular to one another, like this, right, they're pointing uh, perpendicular to one another, that the dot product between those two things is zero, right? So, um, remember, earlier I just argued if the fpx uh, component goes away, if I was just pulling up, um, then, right, the work is going to be zero. Well, yeah. In the same way, right, the dot product, if you have fp pointing straight up and displacement uh, is going that way, of course, there's not going to be any displacement in that direction uh, in the case where there's no other force pulling it that way. Uh, but in that case, right, fp dot d, if fp is going straight up and d is going uh, perpendicular to that, is going to be zero, right? Just like I had argued um, it would be if fpx uh, goes to zero. So uh, this is tracking with our uh, intuition here. Now, um, let's also talk about in the case where I have friction, just, just very briefly. So if I add friction into this problem, mu, okay, friction is always going to just oppose motion. That's the way that uh, friction works. So uh, we would then have a force vector uh, pointing in this direction, right? The friction force would be opposing uh, the box. How would this modify things? Well, it wouldn't modify at all the work that is done by uh, the uh, done by fp, so long as the displacement vector was still the same. Uh, it's just that there would be a second term, uh, or a second uh, force, bringing about a net work on the object. So uh, I would then have two different works to calculate. I have the work done by fp, which would be uh, this here. I would also have the work done by the friction force. Now what would the work done by the friction force be? The work done by the friction force would be, well, it's F friction dot with the displacement. Sorry, I'll get, get all this stuff out of the way. OK. The force of friction, the dot product between the force of friction uh, and the displacement vector d uh, would be the work done by uh, the friction force. Well, notice that d is going that way, and F is going uh, the other way. So the two are anti-parallel. They're pointing directly opposite one another. And if you remember from my lecture on dot products, right, this then would be uh, when you have uh, the, the dot product between two vectors that perfectly oppose one another. Uh, the dot product then is minus uh, the magnitude of one uh, times the magnitude of the other. So. Right? This is where the dot product becomes, uh, it it's, gets its most negative value, or its, its, its minimal value would be uh, minus uh, the product of the um, magnitudes of the two vectors. So uh, I would have then a work done by FP, uh, F pole. Uh, that would be a positive number. Uh, and then I would have this negative work done by friction. And my net work then, W net, would be uh, the work that's done by friction plus the work that's done by uh, FP. And this is the thing, W net, that would be equal to uh, the change in kinetic energy. OK? It's always, so remember this, uh, this is called the WEP. Uh, WEP says that 
uh, the net work on an object is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy, right? Or the change in one half mv squared. Okay, write that on your equation sheet right now. Uh, it's important. The WEP is going to come back again and again. Uh, there we go. And um, so the network, right, is going to be uh, just the sum of the work done by friction and the work done by FP. So that's the thing that you want to set equal to the change in kinetic energy. It would make absolutely no sense to set that, uh, the, this one term here equal to the change in kinetic energy or this other term here equal to the change in kinetic energy since these two are, neither of these two are net work. Right? They're both just the work done by one specific force. Now, important thing to keep in mind uh, here is the sign of the two things. Now, work, let's think about work in terms of an analogy. Okay? Let's say, uh, let's put it in monetary terms. So you have a bank account. Um, you could make a change of, say, $10 to your bank account. Uh, but it's really, really important whether that change is, let's uh, say, a positive change, right? You deposit $10 into your account, or a negative change, right? You take and uh, spend $10 out of your bank account, right? In the same way, it's equally important to keep uh, track of whether the work that is done on an object is positive or negative, okay? There is positive work done by FP in this case because FP has a component that's going along D, right? FP and D have at least some components along one another. So their dot product is going to be positive. So there's a positive contribution to the work here that is done. The friction force is completely opposing uh, the displacement. So the work that is done by the friction force is going to be negative, OK? Uh, make sure to get the signs right when you're talking about uh, work, and um, uh, this will make a big difference. Uh, finally, I should say, since I did introduce kinetic energy here, uh, that the units, the SI units, uh, for both work and kinetic energy are going to be, uh, well, let's just see, this is 1 half times M times V squared. Well, what's the units for M? Uh, well, that's kilograms. What's the units, the SI units for V, velocity? Well, it's uh, meters per second. So um, uh, the SI unit then for uh, kinetic energy would be a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Or another way uh, that we, uh, the word that we give to this is a joule, J. J, the joule, is a kilogram uh, meter squared per second squared. Uh, it is also equal to, if you remember, that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Uh, this is also equal to a newton times a meter, right? As you would expect from uh, this definition of work as being uh, force dot displacement. Okay, this uh, is all very useful stuff. This kinetic energy thing, one, one more time, let's just say, the kinetic energy thing and the work uh, energy principle thing here. These are generally true every case, no matter what happens uh, for the force. Now, this definition of work as being uh, force uh, times distance is only true in this special case where constant forces, uh, we have constant forces, and the two, the force vector and uh, the displacement vector are parallel to one another. So this isn't going to happen that often. Keep that in mind. The more general one is uh, F uh, dot D, right, this one here. This is more general, right? Of course, if F and D are along one another, then uh, this just reduces to this one. So you don't really have to remember this at all. Just know how to apply this. Uh, this still is subject to this constraint where we have a constant force. So um, keep that in mind. Work is equal to force dot uh, displacement when there is a constant force. Okay, before we get to non-constant forces, let's go through some quick examples. And they should be ones that you're kind of familiar with because uh, they were just uh, on a test. So um, let's just do, okay, so I'm going to go through uh, the problems from this test and I'm going to talk now instead of about forces, about the work that those forces are doing. 
So uh, what I would like is for you to, uh, as I'm going through and explaining these, before I do uh, go through and explain everything, just pause the video and think about it yourself first, okay? Think about how much work each course is doing. So uh, let's go through, we'll start with, uh, we'll, we'll start with B, and then we'll do C, D, uh, and E, and then we'll go back and do um, the other forces in a minute. So in all of these cases, we have constant forces. So uh, force dot displacement then is going to be our work, right? If, if, if F is constant, then work is uh, F dot displacement. Uh, and you can use the WEP uh, to find, say, uh, final velocities from initial velocities and things like that. So uh, you can also use, uh, sometimes, uh, the other way around, you can use, say, the change in uh, kinetic energy, if that's known to you, to figure out uh, how much work is done by uh, the individual forces. So let's go ahead and get started with part B. So in part B, there is a pendulum bob swinging uh, from uh, right to left, or you know, in, in, in other words, it's swinging down toward the bottom. Uh, it was uh, higher you know, up here than it was uh, as pictured, right? meaning it's just going down in this direction here. And um, let's, uh, let's take a look at the free body diagram, and then we'll just determine how much work each of the forces are doing. So here I drew a picture, right? I wrote down my givens. I am given then uh, that is initially at an angle theta, and I am given that its final location is right down here at the bottom. Okay, and I want to find out how much work is done uh, by the tension force and by uh, the weight, right? Which are the two forces uh, acting on this pendulum bob uh, in this case. Uh, and I'm also given that the length uh, of the pendulum is L. Okay, now, uh, this is what the free body diagram looks like, right? Tension goes along the string, weight pulls uh, straight down on this uh, pendulum knob right here. So, uh, how much work is being done by the tension force? Think about it. So, uh, work is F dot displacement. Now, as this thing swings down, its displacement is always right, tangential to this like circular path that it sweeps out, right? And the tension force is always pulling straight in towards the center of that circular path. So the displacement at any given time is always along the circle, tangential to the circle. At every point, the, te uh, the tension force is perpendicular to that, right? It's always pointing in towards the center. So the uh, dot product between the tension force and the displacement hard to point this way. Uh, the displacement is in that direction, right? The tension is in this direction here. Uh, the dot product between those two is always going to be zero because the two are always perpendicular to one another. Displacement is along the circular path, tangential to it, uh, and the, the tension is pointing in towards the center of the circular path. So the two are perpendicular to one another. When I take the dot product between the tension and the displacement, it's going to be zero. So the work done by the tension force is going to be zero. Cool. Now, what about uh, the weight? So the weight, or mg, as I've drawn it here, is pulling straight down. Now, there is a component of the displacement right, that's going down uh, right here to start. Uh, there's not here once it gets to the bottom, uh, but that's OK, uh, because uh, what we do know is that this uh, weight is the force, uh, is, is a force that's acting uh, in the y direction down. Uh, and there is a displacement, right, from its initial location to its final, right? So if I draw a horizontal line here, right, uh, it's initially, uh, initially, uh, this was at, so the length of the string is L, that angle there is theta. So it was initially, say, L cosine theta, L cosine uh, cosine theta uh, below this uh, point. And when it finishes up, it's going to be all the way down here at a full L uh, distance, L uh, down from the pivot point. So uh, its displacement, its net displacement in Y is going to be, well, its final location, so L minus its initial location, which was L cosine theta. So I have a displacement in Y. That's good. Now I can multiply my displacement in Y by uh, the force, right? Because the force and the displacement in this case are perpendicular, I mean, sorry, are parallel to one another, right? The displacement is straight down. The weight is always pulling straight down. So uh, the 
for the work then that is done by uh, the weight, by mg, is going to be mg times L minus L cosine theta. There, I have the amount of work that is done by each force, right? The work done by the tension force was zero. The work done by the weight was weight times L minus L cosine theta. And remember that L was given and theta was given. So I have this all, uh, and well, the mass uh, M of the pendulum uh, would also have to be given. So uh, we have this then in terms of all givens. Now, what would the final velocity be? Well, I can determine that. I'm, I'm not going to do it now, but let's say that it, its uh, initial velocity was uh, zero when it was up at the angle theta, right? You can use the work energy principle to determine what the final uh, velocity would be, right? So let's, let, let's just do it. Uh, what, what the heck? So let's just say that it started out at the initial is zero. Uh, what's the final speed once it gets to the bottom? Well, the final speed is going to be, um, so if the initial velocity is zero, so I'm pointing over here to uh, the, the WEP, the work energy principle. So uh, one half mv final squared uh, is, is going to be non-zero. One half mv initial squared will be zero. So uh, I can set the net work done. Well, the work done by tension is zero. So the net work done is just the work done by the weight. I can set then mg uh, times L minus L cosine theta equal to then uh, 1 half m the final squared m the final squared. OK, um, I can cancel out mass from both sides of this. Mass goes away. Right? I can multiply by 2 to get rid of that 1 half there. OK, multiplying by 2. OK, now I can take the square root of both sides to get uh, the final alone right there. And what I get then is that the final velocity is equal to 2 times g times uh, uh, this quantity L minus L cosine theta, all under a square root. OK, so I just applied the work energy principle uh, to find, say, the final speed uh, or the, the maximum speed of a pendulum that's swinging when it starts up at an angle theta uh, at rest. So uh, this is a very practical tool, right? This would have been uh, much harder to determine using Newton's second law. OK, cool. So that's part B. Let's go on to part C. Uh, so in part C, it says a puck slides across ice, traveling to the right at constant speed. OK, here's my puck. It is on ice. It is traveling to the right at constant speed. So um, pause the video. Think about it yourself. Uh, OK, now I'm going to go through it. Um, it's traveling at constant speed. What does that mean? Uh, that means, then, if, if the velocity is constant and force is change in velocity, uh, I'm sorry, if acceleration is change in velocity, if force is mass times acceleration, well, the acceleration is zero. So that means the force must be zero, right? If the velocity is constant, the, for, uh, the acceleration is zero, and therefore uh, the force is zero. So if there's no force acting on this object here, then uh, there is no work being done on the object, OK? So the work is just zero, because there's no forces acting on it. Uh, of course, right, there is a normal force. Uh, there is a weight pulling down. But neither of them are doing any work at all because the displacement is all along the horizontal direction. OK. Now, this, uh, you also could have expected this just by looking at the WEP. It says that the net work done on the object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. Well, if the velocity was constant, then there was no change in kinetic energy. Therefore, the net work was going to be 0. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Uh, now let's uh, go on to part D. Here we uh, modify the problem a bit. Um, here we are told uh, we have the same puck, right, for part D, but here uh, the velocity, right, the object is still sliding to the right, but it is slowing down, right? The, uh, the, the, the velocity is no longer constant. Uh, going in the same direction, but now it is slowing down. Well, what's going to make a puck sliding across the surface slow down? Friction, right? Friction is going to be the, the culprit here that's causing this. 
So here's how my free body diagram would be modified. Right? I have now a friction force uh, that is, um, that is uh, perturbing this, uh, this motion um, to the right. So um, now notice right, the displacement here, let's say it travels a uh, distance L, or sorry, a distance D, let's call it D. Uh, if, this, uh, if it travels a displacement uh, D, well, the friction force is acting uh, in opposition to the displacement vector, right? So the displacement vector would be pointing in this direction here, right? This would be the displacement vector. So when I take uh, the force of friction dot with the displacement vector, then I'm going to get a negative number. The two are anti-parallel to one another. So uh, the work that is done by the friction force is going to be right, um, uh, uh, force of friction dot displacement. Right, They're anti-parallel to one another. So I'm going to get minus right, the magnitude of the friction force uh, times uh, the, dis the total distance traveled, uh, capital D. Okay. Now, uh, then I can put in uh, that, that uh, the friction force is mu times the normal force, right? And I could get uh, the total work done by friction. Uh, and then if I wanted to find the final speed, say, uh, or the change in the kinetic energy uh, when it travels this distance d, um, then I can find uh, from that, say, the, um, I can determine some of the kinematic properties. Uh, but I know that, I, that the net work that is done on this object is going to be just that work that is done by friction, right? The normal force and the weight are both perpendicular to the displacement, so they're not going to do any work. So there's just net, the net amount of work that is done is negative. There's negative net work done on the hockey puck, right? Uh, so that means that uh, its speed will go down, right? According to the WEP, its final velocity then will have to be less than uh, its initial velocity because the work that is done on it is negative. Okay, great. So that's, uh, we've done now B and C and D. Now let's go on to part E. In part E, here, pause the video, uh, think about it yourself. Okay. So in part E, there is a constant rotation rate, uh, or constant rotation rate of a, an album, right, that's going around in a circle. Uh, and there is a coin that is placed near the edge as the thing is uh, rotating, and uh, it uh, stays there, stays put in the spot where it is placed on the album um, as the album is going around. So uh, that means, right, it's going to trace out a path, right, like this, as it goes around on this uh, album here. Um, what does the free body diagram look like? Well, we have a normal force uh, pushing up, right, holding the thing from crashing through the album. Uh, there is weight pulling down. Uh, the normal force and the weight offset one another. There's a friction force that's pointing in towards the center, right? That is the centripetal force. That is the thing that keeps this uh, from sliding off uh, the edge of the album. Okay. Now, uh, what about the work? Well, the work done by the normal force is going to be zero, right? Because the displacement is always like going around in this circular path, right? It's going around. Uh, so if the, if the turntable, let's say, is sitting on top of my hand, so the, the coin is going around like this, right? the normal force is pointing straight up towards the ceiling. So it's not in this, this plane. Uh, the normal force is always going to be perpendicular to the displacement, therefore. So the work done by the normal force is zero. What about the work done by the weight? Well, that's also zero for the same reason. Now, the work done by friction. Let's think about this. Uh, huh. Well, the net work done on that coin is going to be equal to uh, changing kinetic energy, right, by the uh, work energy principle. So that's good to know. Uh, and it's traveling at a constant rotation rate, right? The coin is traveling at a constant rotation rate. So that means. Right, that the initial velocity and the final velocity are going to be exactly the same. There's no change in the kinetic energy, and therefore the net work done on the object is going to be zero. So since there's only three forces acting on the object, it's uh, W net is going to be right, the work done by friction 
plus the work done by uh, gravity uh, plus the work done by uh, the normal force, right? These things here are zero. We already determined that. The network has to be zero, right? And therefore, uh, the work done by friction is also going to be equal to zero. All right. So there I just argued, uh, so this, this here is very similar to the argument I made about the tension over here. Um, the only thing that I did is I, I made the argument starting from uh, the work net, uh, from the WEP, rather than telling you uh, the, the, the other way that I could have explained it, uh, which is to say, well, the displacement at any given point is always uh, tangential to the path, and the friction force is pointing in towards the center of the path. Therefore, the displacement and uh, the friction force are always perpendicular to one another, so the work that is done by friction uh, is also zero, right? Those are two different ways of explaining the same thing. Okay. Okay, I got sick of the whiteboard, so, or the blackboard, so we'll go to the computer. A box of mass M. Slides a distance, capital D, up a frictionless ramp of angle theta. The box is pushed by a person exerting a constant horizontal force, FP. Find the work done by all forces, and then given that it is initially at rest, find the, veloc the final velocity. Okay. So I underlined all the givens, circled uh, the things that I am looking to find. Let's do this problem. So, let's see. First thing to do is to make a free body diagram. So, here's M. Uh, FP, pushing it up. It's... Uh, we also are going to have a normal force that pushes out from the ramp. And let's see, we will have a weight going down, mg. And that should pretty much exhaust uh, the forces that we have. So we know that the box slides up the ramp. We are told that it is frictionless, so um, no need for friction. Now, let's talk about uh, our coordinate system. Let's set it up so that x is going up the ramp, y is going vertical to the ramp. This will be helpful because our displacement vector, which I will, I will use a different color for that, right? our displacement vector is entirely in the x direction. Right? So I don't, now that's not a force, right? This is not part of my free body diagram. That's why I made it, a, it's a displacement, uh, but I made it a different, that's why I made it a different color. Uh, so that displacement is entirely in the x hat direction. We can just call it d times x hat. You could add on there a plus zero y hat if you wanted to. Um, that's our displacement vector. So uh, let's take a look. First of all, uh, I know the work done by one of these forces right off, uh, right off the bat. Right. If you take a look at uh, the normal force, tell me how much work is done by the normal force. Well, of course, the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement vector, which means that the work is done that is done is zero. Right. The normal force is perpendicular to the displacement vector. Work is force dot displacement. So the dot product between two perpendicular vectors is zero. The work done, therefore, by the normal force is zero. In fact, the work done by the normal force is always zero for any object that's moving along a surface. Okay. Now, um, what about the other forces? So, uh, well, what we need is to find the component of FP that's uh, along the displacement vector, capital D, and we'll also need to find, right, the component of the force of gravity uh, that is uh, along x. So let's get the x component of both of these forces. Then I can get uh, you know, the work, say, by fp is going to be uh, fpx times um, d displacement x, x component plus fpy times uh, d uh, the displacement y component. Right, of course, the displacement is y component is zero, so this is going to be zero. So uh, we just need to get uh, fpx and multiply it to dx. Um, and for the, the work done by uh, the 
gravitate or the weight of the gravitational force is going to be um, the same thing, right? You're going to have, uh, say, the weight's x component times displacement in x plus the weight's y component times displacement in y, but the displacement in y is zero. So really, we just need um, the force of gravity in x times uh, that displacement in x. Right. And the displacement at x was even given to us, so it's just fgx times that capital D. Uh, this will be right fpx times that capital D. All right, so all I need then uh, is to get the x components of these two forces. So uh, one of them is pretty easy, so long as you remember that uh, for an inclined plane uh, angled at theta, um, there is, I'm going to use a different color for the components here, um, there is a angle uh, here that you know this one is theta right so if, if the inclined plane is angled at theta then this angle uh, here is theta so uh, that means uh, mg times cosine theta will be going uh, straight into the board and mg times sine theta will be this component here along x so uh, fgx is mg fgx is mg times cosine theta. So uh, therefore, right, the work done by uh, the weight is mg, oh, I'm sorry, did I say cosine? That's not at all what I meant to say, because cosine is going into the board, this will be times sine theta. So I have mg sine theta as uh, the component of x uh, times capital Z. Okay. Uh, one thing that I'm missing, though, you might have caught this, is that uh, the x component of gravity is, of course, opposing opposing uh, the displacement, right? They are not uh, pointing in the same direction. So that means we need a minus sign here. Uh, the work done is going to be minus mg sine theta d. Okay, that's the work done uh, by the weight. Now, let's get the x component of uh, fp so that we can get uh, this value here. So this would be, let's see, um, so fpx is going to be right, the component along here. This would be fpx. And here, this part here is fpy. So um, this angle here, uh, this is a tricky angle. Um, let's just let's just get this. Uh, I'll, I'll help you with this one because this one's tough. So this angle here is theta. That means um, right. Uh, so this angle between this and this line extended down from uh, the normal force. This here is a right angle, right? Um, and this here is also a right angle. Um, and this here is furthermore a right angle. Uh, so that means, right, we have, right, these two, the, the sum of this angle here uh, and that angle will be 90 degrees. Uh, since the sum of this angle here and this angle is also 90 degrees, this would make, that would make this 90 degrees minus theta. And uh, that would make that would mean that this angle here is theta. So there you have it, that angle is theta. Now, um, fpx then is going to be fp times cosine theta. Uh, so I can put that into here. fp times cosine of theta is uh, times capital D will be the work done by fp. Okay, great. So, um, this works out uh, really nicely. We have uh, the network then is going to be W of P plus W W gravity uh, plus right the work done by the normal force because those are the three forces acting on our box. Uh, but the work done by the normal force is zero, so this is going to be uh, F P cosine theta times capital D minus M G sine theta times capital D. Uh, that means then uh, by the WEP or the work energy principle, we know 
that uh, W net is equal to uh, 1 half M P final squared minus 1 half M P initial squared, right? Uh, it says that it was initially at rest, therefore this is going to be zero. So uh, velocity, so 1 half then uh, uh, M times velocity final squared is going to be equal to uh, this quantity here, FP cosine theta capital D minus MG sine theta times D. So um, let's uh, get the final velocity then, because that's what we were asked to find over here. Uh, so I can divide both sides of this by M. That will cancel out that M. Uh, and I can multiply by 2. So multiply this whole thing by 2 those and take the square root uh, and I will get that the final velocity is equal to square root of 2 times uh, fp over m cosine theta d minus g sine theta d. Okay and that is my final answer. Now um, just one thing to point out here uh, this sometimes disturbs students to see, wait a minute, you told me that work was a dot product and that that is uh, the magnitude of F times the magnitude of, of D times the cosine of the angle between there. Where do you get off telling me that this work that was done, say, by the weight has a sine theta in it? Um, so the reason is right that that this uh, this cosine theta here is the angle between these two displacement vectors. So uh, what's the angle between these two displacement vectors in this in this case? Well, here I'll, I'll use I'll use black. I haven't used that yet. So this angle here, say between um, the the weight and the displacement vector, is going to be this angle there. So this isn't the theta from the inclined planes angle, right? That's different. So um, this is the black, uh, the, the black angle there. So that cosine theta, uh, the cosine of that angle just turns out to be, you know, minus sine of this, uh, this the theta from the uh, inclined plane. Don't just go throwing angles uh, into here when uh, when you're trying to find work or when you're trying to find dot products, make sure it's the right angle, right? Just because you were given uh, that angle theta doesn't mean that uh, you can always take that exact angle and stick it in here. Okay, I hope that helps. Uh, next time we will talk about work done by non-constant forces.